Hi, guys. So you guys having fun yet? Yeah? Has it, whoa, that's good. I like that. I, I think you guys could make a little more noise. Are you having fun yet? Yeah. There we go. Look at that. OK, good. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk to you about soil roots and Kernza. So I actually didn't know that I was talking about, oops, how do I go back? There we go. I didn't know that I was talking about grasslands, but grasslands is like one of my favorite things to talk about, so that's really fun. Um, so I'm with Gateway Research Organization. Well, we are, we're an agricultural research association. So how many of you guys here come from farm backgrounds or farm families? Okay, so a few here. Um, so a lot of the things that happens on the farm, there's different breeding of seeds and stuff that needs to be put into, you know, crops. Um, crops are changing all the time. As, as new diseases emerge, we, people will be breeding, scientists will be breeding new, um, new crops so that they can combat those diseases. So there's a lot of reasons why research happen with crops and cropping systems. Um, research happens a lot with cattle and with grazing as well, and you'll hear about that from Dr. Ed Bork in a little bit. But I'm going to talk to you about Kernza. So Kernza typically um, perennial is a perennial grain, and perennial grains are a type of grains that, unlike if you see wheat out in the fields, it only grows for one year. So it grows in that one season, you go, you harvest it, and doesn't grow back, and then the next season the farmer has to come in and they have to reseed it. Um, perennial grains are something that are, are, have been worked on for a while that are being bred so that you get two, three, four, even up to five years of being able to harvest after one seeding. So kind of like if you think of uh, strawberry plants, strawberry plants come back, you, put a, you seed a strawberry plant, and then the next year you don't have to reseed it again, you just get to go and enjoy s strawberries. Um, so that's, that's the idea of a perennial plant. And perennial grains would give farmers a lot of opportunity to not have to seed, not have to use as much um, chemicals and stuff, right? So our trials that we've had in, at Gateway Research Organization, we did use uh, fertilizers and some control chemicals for the first year, but we're three years in now, we haven't had to use them since that first year. The idea is to be able to sequester more carbon with plants that have roots in the soil, so you don't have to till things up. Um, you're not ripping up the soil on a regular basis, and it just comes back, and it also makes it more economical to grow food. Uh, Kernza is being used currently in the States for beer and bread, however, it's not available commercially yet in Canada. So, Kernza has a lot of opportunities. They are still breeding it. it. Currently, the yield isn't as high as what you see in our wheat fields today. It's an opportunity and hopefully at some point they will get to the point where it's commercially available. But these are some of the solutions that a lot of scientists are working on right now to come up with the climate crisis, solutions for helping our environment, for helping resist droughts and help with flooding and all of the different things that we're seeing right now. There's a lot of different, different ways that we can work with our environment to heal things. And really what it all comes down to is soil health, when it comes down to it. And I don't know if we're going to disagree on that. <laughs> every, every, everybody has a different idea. But when it comes down to it, like soil health is so important. And when we look at different plants and root systems and everything, that's one of the reasons that we, we are working so hard for this, because we don't understand fully what goes on into the soil, in the soil right now. So these soil health principles, this is by Understanding Egg. This is kind of their model. Um, they're a group out of the United States. And so there's a lot of things we can do to improve our soil health, but these are six that are pretty good at helping out and, and making sure that our soil is in good shape. So. The first one we're going to talk about is biodiversity. Biodiversity is one of my favorite things because I love bugs. I'm a weird person like that. We have a whole bunch of spiders on our house right now and I love it. I'm like, look at those, those cat-faced orb weavers. They're really cool. Um, my daughter doesn't think they are so much. 
I think they're cool. So, but when we talk about biodiversity, there's biodiversity all over the place. So we want to look at biodiversity in plant life. When you get multiple species of plants, that allows for multiple types of food, for bugs, it allows for food for wildlife, it allows for, you know, so getting that biodiversity is really important when it comes down to it. Um, you need a biodiversity in root systems because when you that again there's a whole bunch of bugs in our soil and those root systems are things like mycorrhizal fungi which we'll talk about in a second um, stuff feeds off of that and it sloughs off and it adds carbon to the soil and there's just so much that goes into di having different root systems uh, to, to help with the soil so biodiversity in soil life again I really like bugs um, earthworms are really cool, not a bug, that's okay. Um, earthworms are, are super cool, so I think everyone here knows what an earthworm is, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna guess so. Uh, dung beetles, do you guys know what dung beetles are? I, yeah, I see some nods. Dung beetles are my favorite. Um, they're really interesting to try and watch, and they don't like being caught on camera a whole lot, even though I try, and it probably looks ridiculous when I'm out in the field, and I'm like, I'm going to sit here by this pile of poop, and I'm going to, yeah, take video. So dung beetles are cool, because what they do is when an animal goes to the bathroom, the dung beetles will sit in the dung, and they will bring it down into the soil, and they feed those nutrients into the soil, so then the soil bugs can get it. Um, so they're, they're really interesting for that. And you'll notice if there's a good population of dung beetles, the soil, the, the dung pats don't stay in the field for very long because they end up going into the soil and they, they don't waste away. Uh, nematodes are another really cool thing. Nematodes are really interesting. Those, um, I have a friend who's a soil scientist and she just gets a kick out of counting nematodes under a microscope. So if any of you guys are looking for careers in agriculture and you like to count bugs, there's, there's work in that, you can do it. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi, so mycorrhizal fungi is kind of like the internet of the soil. So it is on roots, it's a fungus that's on roots and it actually spreads information from plant to plant. So if you have a lot of mycorrhizal fungi in your soil, um, it can, like if there's, there's a plant that has a disease or something, it can send information to a plant nearby that'll help that plant prepare itself for that disease. And it's, so yes, I, I won't have time to really go into this, but there's a lot of really cool things that happen in the soil. And overall, there's, in one cup of healthy soil has six billion organisms. That's a lot of things in the soil. So having um, our practices above ground really impact what's happening below ground. And we might not see it, but it's very important when it comes to carbon sequestration and to just making sure that your soil is healthy and able to grow good plants. So, and then another biodiversity is biodiversity in livestock. So we've, we've played with a bunch of things. This can be fairly con com complicated, so you don't see a lot of producers necessarily doing um, grazing with multiple animals. But we have put chickens in with our pigs in the past. We had a llama in with them, and the llama was funny. Uh, do you guys, have you guys uh, ever spent time with llamas? Yeah? Okay, llamas are absolutely ridiculous. They're the most ridiculous animal. And you have them out with pigs. If you go pick up a pig, those llamas will come chasing after you. They, yeah, and the pigs squeal and it's, it's a lot of noise out in the pasture. Um, so we've had llama and then we also, currently we're running our pigs on the same grasslands that our cattle run which means that there's different types of manure. Again, we're getting that biodiversity in, in different things and it's really important. So then you also get a biodiversity in wildlife. And this is really cool. I took this video out in Jasper this summer. Did you guys know black bears graze? Yeah, there's a couple nods there. I found out that black bears, actually the majority of their diet is through grazing. That's crazy. That's great. We should farm black bears and we could have black bears and we could try to herd them. Is that a good idea? No, <laughs> not a good idea? Okay. Well, I thought he was really cool and I was super excited to see him grazing. Um, so biodiversity and wildlife too. When you're taking care of all of the rest of the system and you're, you have biodiversity everywhere, you will get the biodiversity and wildlife. So you'll see deer and you'll see fox and you'll see a lot of the things that farmers don't necessarily always love but they're there for a purpose and it's, they, they need to be there too. 
Um, soil armor is the next soil health principle that we're going to talk about. So soil armor is something that Kearns uh, and perennial grains lend themselves to really well. What's, uh, what soil armor means is basically that there's something left on top of the soil covering it. So having something on the top of the soil means that it's protected from heavy rainfalls, it's protected from, it keeps the water in the soil, and that's really important. Um, you know, it, it's, yeah, it, it protects the bugs, it gives them a home to live in. So there's a lot of things that go into it. It helps repair the water cycle, it regulates the temperature of the soil. So this is one of the projects that we have at the Gateway Research Organization. And we have basically the average producer puts their animals out in the summer to graze and they just leave them out in, in the summer. Um, then there's something that we call rotational grazing, it's also called amp grazing. Um, and there's mob grazing. So there's different, how many times you move the animals across the landscape is basically what it's doing. And what it does, one of the reasons and the theories behind moving the animals versus leaving them is as you can see here, this is really patchy and the brown stuff, the brown grass has gone to seed. So it's, it's very variable. So what the animals will do, they'll come in and they're gonna pick their very favorite plants. It's like if you are at, um, an all-you-can-eat buffet, and there's some really good desserts, but there's like, I don't know, what's a dessert? Most Rice pudding versus banana splits, right? The banana splits are all gonna go first, and what's gonna be left is the rice pudding, and it's gonna get old and stale because people just aren't going to eat. I don't know, I don't like rice pudding, maybe you guys do. Um, but that's, that's what happens in continuous grazing, where when you're, ro you're moving the animals, they never get a chance to overgraze, to sit there and graze their favorite plants. Um, so it's better for the land, and then you can also, you have a lot more control over whether or not you're leaving that soil armor, and that soil armor is very important to the soil health principles. Living roots is another one that comes in with the biodiversity of roots. You need to have living roots in the soil for as much of the year as possible. Um, so again, this is feeding the bugs, feeding the soil microbiology that really needs to be there. And it's important, li having living roots throughout. So that's another thing that Kernza and ACE1 perennial rye and different perennial plants have going in their favor is the fact that there's always a root in the soil that's, that's processing things. Um, integrating livestock is the next soil health principle. Th there's a physical component to animal impact. So when you have any type of animals, and I'm gonna use cows here because we've got a lot of cows. You can do it with sheep, pigs, everything. We have pigs as well. There's the physical stuff that they do. So our pigs are really good at going and rooting up and, and stuff, and they almost do their own type of, type of tillage. There's a guy up in Grand Prairie who has 300 pigs that he grazes on cropland and he leaves them on, I think it's 10 acres of cropland or an acre, I don't know. He leaves them on a bit of cropland for a whole year, his 300 pigs, and they farrow out there, they do everything, and then he moves it the next year and he doesn't come back to that piece for, for 13 years. After that, he'll seed crops into that land and there's been fertilizer and stuff on there. So pigs are really good for rooting things up. Cows will just kind of step on things and get things moving that way. It can cause seed to soil contacts. Um, so yeah, they'll also put push plant material to ground, all of the different livestock do. Animals bring in a different biological com component into the system as well. So um, their drool, their snot, their poop, like everything. Um, ends up bringing different stuff that bugs can feed on. And there's so much happening. This is one of the things that I absolutely love about agriculture, is there's so many things happening that we have no idea about. There's so many different ecosystems that are involved when it comes to bringing animals on the landscape that it, they all work together and it's super important. So the bi biological component of animal impact is really important because there's a lot of symbiotic relationships between herbivore and soil biology. Um, the next one is context. So this is something that even before you guys walked in the room, uh, Dr. Ed Bork and I were kind of talking about. And so not all environments are the same. People like to have recipes. People like to know exactly what they need to do. But you can't give a recipe for a lot of this stuff. You've got to know your environment. And if you don't know your context, um, when you're farming, right? Perennial wheat, let's say, with the Kernza. It's not going to work in Antarctica. 
um, it's not going to grow well there. It likes, it likes actually our weather here. So if it's down in California, it might not do as well. Um, so whether that's crops, whether that's livestock or anything else, if you look at the environment, what animals are best suited to different environments? Right? Um, in, if you have smaller landscapes, if you're thinking England or something, maybe sheep or something are better, or really wet environments, it's going to be different animals for the environment. And so context is really, really important when talking about soil health because it, you can have all the great ideas in the world, but if you have to throw in a ton of fertilizer to make something grow, either it ends up being not economical, it ends up hurting the environment, whereas if you're growing something that's already grows in your environment or is, is good for growing in your environment, you're going to do a lot better. And minimizing soil disturbance. So I kind of touched on tillage a little bit here. So tilling is when they go, the farmers go and rip up the ground and kind of get all of the plant material and stuff back into the soil in once they're done harvest in the fall. Can you guys tell me after this what, what would be why tillage might not be the best idea? Sure. That is definitely one of them because it leaves the bare open soil. Yep, yep, because again, you don't have the soil armor, right? Yeah. That's a really good one. So it destroys that protection that you get from the soil. So tillage, I, I'm not going to say that, you know, every time someone tills, it's really, really bad. But I think that when looking at any farming practices, we need to look at the long-term value and gain that we're getting from that and what it's doing to these ecosystems. So, you know, if, if you absolutely need to till, if a farmer really needs to till and he's doing it once in 20 years, is that the end of the world? No. Is there better practices that he might be able to figure out? Possibly. Um, but it's to take everything in, again into that context, right? And, and is that fitting for the context, is that actually hurting the ecosystem more than it's going to be able to recover? Um, so it's important to look at. So perennial grains, back to kind of that, they kind of hit a lot of these. So in the video, um, you heard Steve talk about how he'd love to see some biodiversity in it, not just a monoculture crop. Now it's research trials. Just this year, we did seed into to some Kernza, an understory, so clover and, and everything. So we're getting a little more variety into these. So we, we will have the monoculture and then we'll have different trials going with different types of plants in with the system to see how they react. And then we're measuring, we're measuring the soil um, for microbiology in it. We're looking at the carbon in the soil and then the, like, uh, yeah, the chemical components of the soil at the same time. So we're measuring for that. Perennial grains hit on the soil armor thing because they're leaving something on top of the soil throughout the year, which is really nice. Um, they hit on the living roots because they're growing all throughout the winter. They're still there. There's roots in the ground. Uh, integrating livestock is another possibility, and this hasn't been trialed on it yet. It's something we want to do, is can we take animals and go and graze the Kernza, and then will it still respond well the next year and still come back? Because if we can strip graze it, well, that's another way that, that farmers could make some money off of it. So even if they don't make as much off of the actual grain, if they can make money off of the, the animals, then that works too. Context, again, that's something that Kernza is good in our area, our environment here. And then minimizing soil disturbance, because we don't have to till. And do we have questions? Yeah. It's uh, selective breeding with intermediate wheat grass and then wheat. And so they've been working on that since about the 80s. Um, the grain heads are quite a bit smaller, but they are using it for bread and, and beer in the States currently. Yeah. So since you're using this, like, the same crop on the same field over and over again, does that mean if you use it in the same amount of 
That's a great question. Um, so ACE1 perennial rye is another one we're trialing. And that one has a really bad time with ergot. Um, so ergot and it was really bad this year. And that's one of the problems. And that's one of the things like I'd like to see as we work with the Kernza. Kernza is actually really good. It hasn't had it shown any disease whatsoever, which is really interesting. Um, but I'd like to see in our polycultures, when we start putting other plants, is that going to help? because it is planting the same monoculture over and over again that ends up bringing in those diseases. So it's a, it's a possibility, yeah.